So when we think about penile implant surgery, we know that the penile implant is a, is a highly effective treatment option for guys with ED. Of all the different surgeries that we do as urologists, we could say that the penile implant is a great operation in that it does what it's supposed to. It will take a man who is unable to have a rigid penis for penetrative intimacy and restore them back to sexual function. Patient satisfaction is very high. Partner satisfaction is incredibly high. And it's a very interesting history of penile, the penile implant. And I won't go through all the different years, but it's, it's interesting to note that really the first attempts to use a rigid type stent, if you will, to make the penis rigid, to give a man with impotence the ability to have penetrative intimacy was back in about 1936. Uh, some, of this, some of the references I looked at said this an individual, this Borgratz was German, some said he was Russian, uh, but in none, nonetheless, in 1936, he actually used rib cartilage to provide a rigid stent to the penis to allow penetrative intimacy. And of course, there have been a lot of things that have been done in between 1936 and then in the early 70s when we began to think about Dr. Brantley Scott and Dr. Hernan Carrion. Now clearly they were not the only individuals involved in advancing the field of penile prosthetics, but those are the names we really do think about. Dr. Scott was at Baylor, obviously, and in 1973 uh, we found we see his three-piece inflatable penile prosthesis. And it's interesting to look at the old device and to compare it with how devices have changed over the years, there's an inflate and a deflate pump, so there's two separate pumps. We have this pancake kind of reservoir. Uh, you know, a lot of us are used to the spherical reservoir. It's, it's interesting in that what's old or what's new is really old because now a lot of us use a flat reservoir, so we're kind of gone back to a flatter reservoir. But you can look at all the tubing, all the different connections, certainly a difference compared to our devices today. This is the Boston Scientific device, the AMS 700. It has that golden color because of impregnation of, an antibi of antibiotics onto the surface because implant infection had been, continues to be an issue of course, it's the biggest complication you can have after penile implant surgery, but infection rates were very high in the days before these anti-infection or, or infection retardant mechanisms. Again, that antibiotic impregnation is Boston Scientific's approach. There's a single pump. The deflate mechanism is actually a button on the pump. This is the Coloplast device. It's called the Titan, and I think there's no question that when it comes to the names of the devices, Coloplast wins because if, would you rather have a Titan in your penis or an AMS 700? So they need, they need to work on the PR aspect. But the, but the Titan has this, what they call a cloverleaf reservoir that as it fills, it becomes a little flatter. It also has a single pump with a deflate mechanism that's, that's, that's a touch button. So big differences over the years. It's interesting that in the early 70s as well at the University of Miami, Dr. Small and Dr. Carrion were taking a different approach in that they were looking at a semi-rigid or a rigid rod system for their implant. And this is their early device called the Small Carrion device. It's funny, one of, my, one of my partners who has since retired, when he was in residency, they were gonna do, they, were taught they had a patient, they were gonna do a semi-rigid implant, and they told the patient, we're gonna use the small carry-on device, and of course the patient said, well, I'd rather have a big carry-on device, not a small carry-on. This is what we have today. This is the Boston Scientific product called the Spectra, and this is the Coloplast product that's called the Genesis device. So, big differences, but it's about the same time, kind of contemporary with each other, Dr. Scott and his team, Dr. Carrion and his team. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Scott is not with us, Dr. Carrion is, and I think Mo will agree that talking to Hernan Carrion or hearing him give a talk about the history of prosthetic innovation is really fascinating. And it's one of the great things I'll say to the residents who are here, one of the great things about prosthetic urology, here's a pitch for it, is that it's a, it's, it's, it's a young specialty. We can, reach, we can reach out and touch those who've made such a big difference. People like Dr. Carrion and Dr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Furlow, Bill Furlow, who I've had the opportunity to meet. It's a great specialty, has a very interesting history. And in this day and age, we have three primary approaches to placing an inflatable penile prosthesis. And that's what we'll comment, and that's what we'll talk about today, the inflatable device. There's a scrotal approach, there's an infrapubic approach, and there's also a subcoronal incision or subcoronal approach. And each of these things is going to have its own benefits and drawbacks. Let's talk about the scrotal incision first and some of the benefits most surgeons, most urologists are familiar with the scrotal approach. So it's, it's, it's something we're familiar with. You've got great visualization of the corporal bodies and the urethra. 
the incision can be manipulated. What I mean is you can take the scrotal incision and move it up and down, move it up onto the shaft if you needed to have access to the shaft to do plication or grafting. It's got, it allows good proximal control. So if you've got a man who has scarred corporal bodies proximally, for instance, after priapism, you tend to see a lot of scarring proximally, you're right down there, you can work on the proximal corporal bodies. It's got great proximal control with the scrotal incision and it works well with a retractor system, the ring retractor system or the Scott retractor system. But of course, it has some downsides as well. And because everything is being done through the scrotum, you've got a lot of scrotal edema and pain in these guys after surgery. And that can certainly impact how soon they can begin to cycle. I like to have my patients begin to cycle the device really early. That can be tough when you've done all this stuff through the scrotum. It can take four to six weeks. The incision is directly over the pump and the input tubing. So where you've broken the barrier of the skin, the incision is lying right over parts of your device. And of course, we always worry about infection. And so that can give access perhaps a little easier versus something like the infrapubic incision that we'll talk about. The dissection is a little more difficult. It takes a little longer. And we'll address this because you've got a little more tissue to go through than the uh, infrapubic incision. But there are some things that we can do when we're using the scrotal incision to really maximize and to benefit uh, the potential to have a successful outcome. And some of these things apply not only to the scrotal incision or any incision, but I always like to start with an artificial erection. I like to do a mixture of, lic of uh, marcane and uh, injectable saline and then produce a hydraulic erection. And, we'll do, and we will uh, uh, we'll demonstrate that here in a minute. And I do that because you get a hydraulic dilatation of the corporal bodies, which hopefully will make your corporal dilation easier. Also remember, most of these guys haven't had a decent erection in who knows how long. And so when you say, well, do you have any pre-op counseling, do you have any curvature with an erection? And they'll say, nah. Well, you'll get in the OR a lot of times and find out they have a hell of a curve. They've, they've developed peyronies and don't even realize it. Or maybe there's narrowing. There's, there's problems in their anatomy. Better to know that as you're going into the surgery or find out there's a curve rather than find out there's a curve after you've placed the uh, cylinders. We like to use a Foley with the scrotal incision. We always use a retractor system. And we dissect with purpose, and I'll explain that here in just a few minutes. We control the glands during dilation and deployment of the cylinders, and we like our pump and our tubing to be dependent in the scrotum and buried. We like to use a compressive dressing on the scrotum. I didn't put this on. I always like to drain. Some folks drain, some folks don't. I like to drain. There's no downside into draining. It doesn't increase infection. It doesn't decrease infection. But invariably, when the drain comes out at 24 hours, or a patient who's anticoagulated 48 hours, when that drain comes out, there's always something in the drain. And I'd rather have that in the drain than in the guy's scrotum. And we do safety checks, too, and we'll talk about that. So this is a patient who's actually on for, for really, he he's has a combination of ED uh, and Peyronie's disease. And this was actually a subcoronal incision. But the point is, I put this in to show, and we'll show how you do this in a video in a minute, but the artificial erection at the start of the case, this isn't unusual to see something like this when you start a penile implant. Scrotal incision or, or infrapubic or whatever the case is, you'll do an artificial erection and the guy will have a curve. Again, you want to know about that before you put your cylinders in. You don't want to put everything in, pump up the cylinders and the penis is curved and you're like, well, was that there before? Or have I oversized or what have I done? So do an artificial erection at the start. We use the standard setup. We like to use Brooks dilators, but pretty standard setup. And then we do use the ring retractor to put the penis on stretch, and we do place a Foley catheter. And you want the penis on stretch because when you're dilating and when you're deploying your cylinders, you're going to minimize potential for crossover if you've got the penis on stretch in a nice straight line. I like to use this vertical incision. You can use horizontal. Either way, you make your skin incision, you start to put your hooks in, and you're going to use those hooks to maintain exposure as you go deeper into the scrotum. Now, before I said dilate with perp or uh, dissect with purpose, and here's what I mean. I've seen a number of surgeons, and I've done it myself, where you will, you'll make your incision, put your hooks in, then you'll pick up some tissue and cut, then you'll drop the tissue, and you'll pick up some more tissue and cut, and before you know it, it's 10 minutes before you even get to a point where you can put your stitches in for your, to make your corporotomies. Dissect with purpose. So we will pick up the tissue and go right down to the corporal body. In the picture on the left, we've picked up that scrotal tissue, but we will go right down with the cautery, literally right down on top of the corporal body, and then use our hooks like you're seeing on the image on the right side. That's the right corporal body coming into view. Once we do that, we will move those hooks in and 
within just less than a minute, we're down on the corporal body, we've got our hooks positioned, and the right corporal body is in nice view. When we go to the left side, we don't repeat that. What we do is we pick up this veil of tissue that I'm showing on that right image. This veil of tissue lies over the spongiosum. I call it, in, in homage to one of my mentors, I call it the veil of Wilson. We'll pick up the veil of Wilson and we will dissect underneath that and then go right over to the left corporal body. So literally we pick up that tissue, take our mets and kind of separate it from the spongiosum, go over and reset our hooks and that's what you get in that inferior, that, that lower picture. So we dissect down, put our hooks in, lift up the veil of Wilson, dissect directly over and again we dissect with purpose and get right down to the corporal bodies. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of time not because I rush, it doesn't take a lot of time because it's, it's, it's an efficient way to do things. And I wish I could say that I invented all that. I haven't. It's been people, my mentors, who have taught me how to do these things, but it's very efficient. And I said we control the glands when we dilate or when we deploy the cylinders. You want to have control of the glands. You want to have the penis on stretch. You want to control the glands and have that tactile feedback as you pass in the picture on the left, the Metzenbaum scissors to start our dilation. Or then we're using the Brooks in the middle picture. Again, we're controlling the glands. And then when we deploy our cylinders, as in the image on the right, we're controlling the glands. Doing that is going to help prevent crossovers and urethral perforation. Keep the penis on stretch, regardless of the approach you take, take and control the glands. That's going to help prevent mishaps. We like the pump to be dependent. So in this image on the left, we're using a nasal speculum to take that to make a space down deep in the scrotum place the pump down, and then we like to have a multi-tissue closure over the pump and the input tubing because, again, we like to have at least three layers, two or three layers that we close, and then the skin layer to help reduce potential for infection. So you want your pump in a dependent position. You want the pump and the input tubing covered by nice tissue before your skin closure. We do put a drain in, as you can see, and then we do use a, uh, a, a scrotal compressive dressing, there's different ones out there. Uh, we use what's called the mummy wrap, but it's, a, but it's a compressive scrotal dressing. So all of these things that we do to try to, to, try to be efficient, but to try, try to prevent problems that can occur during the case. And if you have problems during the case, perforations or crossover, they're not the end of the world. They're not disasters because you can correct them at the time of the surgery, but you have to know they're there. And that's why we do safety checks, and that's what we're showing here. The safety checks are simple. On the left image, we're using our dilators and passing them down. This is after dilation and such, before deploying cylinders. We pass the dilators, in this case Brooks, down distally to make sure there's no crossover, to make sure the dilators are parallel, parallel so we know there's no crossover. We don't hear any metal touching each other. We know the corporal bodies are intact. In the middle image, we're insufflating uh, irrigation solution into each corporotomy to make sure there's no squirt out through the meatus, so we know we don't have a urethral perforation. And then in the image on the right, we're passing the dilators proximally, again, looking to make sure they're at the same depth so you know you haven't perforated proximally and making sure they're parallel to know you haven't crossed over proximally. Because again, perforations and crossovers can be handled very easily during the surgery, but you've got to know they're there, so one of the pearls do your safety checks. The infrapubic incision is simply another way to get the same job done. I can tell you that I was, uh, that again, one of my primary mentors is Dr. Steve Wilson, and so I, for many years in my career, I did almost all my surgeries through a scrotal approach, but I've morphed a few years ago, and I began to adopt the infrapubic incision, and I adopted it, and that's what I do in well over 90% of my cases now. I adopted it because it is a smaller incision. The dissection is less. The only scrotal manipulation is when you place your pump so men have less edema and less pain. All of that leads to the ability to cycle and use the device sooner. So my patients now come back at three weeks and we teach them how to inflate, deflate, and they're good to go at that point. Now, they may not begin to use it for penetrative sex until four weeks, but they're absolutely cycling, inflating, deflating every day starting at three weeks. And I like them to get back to, I mean, to get to be able to cycle sooner. I think it helps their healing. And you can do that with the infrapubic incision. It's more difficult to have them cycle and use earlier with a scrotal incision because of pain. Less visualization with the scrotal incision, you'll see the incision is smaller. There's no standard retractor, so you have to actively stretch the penis, grasp the glands, and stretch it with your hand when you're dilating and deploying. 
It can be difficult for a surgeon who's used to the scrotal incision to make that transition. It takes some time because you're having to think. It's the same anatomy, but you're looking at it in a different direction. You have to think a little bit more in three dimensions. And you don't have a lot of access to the shaft with the infrapubic incision if you needed to plicate or to graft or something. So this is a patient who I, let's see if I can start it, the, yay. So this is a patient, this is a year or so ago. It's a small incision about a finger breadth below the uh, symphysis and we're gonna start off with the artificial erection. So all we'll do is we'll compress the corporal bodies. That's a mixture of saline and marcaine. We're gonna go ahead and inject that. This man doesn't have a curvature or anything, but it's good to know that before you go in because if he had a curvature, we'd make a plan as to what we would do during the surgery. The incision is pretty small. We don't try to do keyhole surgery, but it's a fairly small incision. We'll go through the skin, and then we're gonna go down through the cautery. And of course, we're careful. We're not really firing up the cautery on the backside of the penis. We don't wanna injure neurovascular bundle. Just like you sweep tissue away from the corporal bodies to the scrotum, we do the same thing with the infrapubic incision. We're gonna do a finger sweep on the lateral aspect on the patient's right, and then on the left, and that's, that's our dissection. You've just seen the entire dissection for the infrapubic incision. Because when you put this retractor in, that's the corporal body that's on the patient's right side. The corporal body is right here. We've already accessed that. And we're gonna use stay stitches just like we do in the scrotal incision. I use monocryl for these. You can use vicryl, whatever you like. We're gonna use these stay stitches to help us control the corporotomy as we do our dilation, we do our deployment, and then we'll use the stay stitches to close. We'll do two stay stitches on each side. So we'll put the second stay stitch on the patient's left. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that same maneuver on the patient's right side. But again, going from the skin to the corporal body is just a matter of millimeters and in less than a minute you're down. Again, not because I'm some kind of slick surgeon, but because it's, it's very efficient. We've got the stay stitches on the right. We're gonna make our corporotomy on the right. And more and more I've moved to, to dilating and measuring with, sun, with a single maneuver. So we'll pass, we'll pass our METs to get things started. Look how I'm controlling the glands and stretching the penis. Because there's no ring retractor, you gotta stretch it with your hand. We'll do a little dilation, or we'll do a little starting. And then we dilate and measure in one step. Again, we control the glands, we're keeping the penis on stretch. We die, and we find that most of the men we can dilate and measure with the furlough, and that's all the further dilatation that one needs to do. But we'll dilate distally and proximally, and then we'll do the same thing on the contralateral side. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's more, it's, it's efficient. It's an efficient procedure. We're gonna do our safety check, and I've edited out the other safety checks, but we safety check by insufflating. We did do a safety check looking for crossover, but I edited that out. So I've measured, I do the same thing on the right. So we'll pass out, dilate and measure in one step. And then I give my measurements to my scrub and she's getting the cylinders ready and we're gonna use the nasal speculum to go to the ring. With the infrapubic incision, you're so close to the external ring that that's all it takes to put the reservoir in. The speculum, you angle it to the bladder, pop through very easily, and then we're gonna roll up that flat reservoir and we're gonna tuck it down there into the perivesical space. If the patient had scarring, had a hostile pelvis, a lot of scarring, you could use a high submuscular location with this incision. Uh, it's not difficult at all. You're right there at the ring. And we always do a test inflation. So our cylinders are deployed. Or, or that's filling the reservoir. I apologize. That's filling the reservoir. Here's the infrapubic device. You'll notice the input tubing is longer going from cylinders to pump because you've got to get that pump down in the scrotum. But we'll deploy it in the same way that you would deploy through the scrotal incision, we use the furlough inserter. We're gonna pass it out, and again, watch, we control the glands, we put the penis on stretch, and we make sure we know where that needle is going to exit the glands. We don't want it to exit through the meatus or have some kind of a misstep like that. So we control the glands, put the penis on stretch, and fire the needle through. And then we're gonna take our cylinders and we're gonna tuck them in. We're gonna go proximal first. And then we'll pull the distal portion of the cylinder in place using the guide stitch. So we do it on the right. 
the left cylinder's in, and we do do a test inflation. This is before we tie our corporotomy stitches. I figure if I've taken the time to put this thing in, I would much rather do a test inflation now rather than after everything's hooked up. So we'll pump it up just to make sure we know what we like. There's a little bit of bleb on the, under the saline under the skin distally on the right from the artificial direction, but that's what that is. But we'll pump it up, make sure we like what we see. If we said, listen, you know what? Maybe we're not sized quite right. Okay, maybe then we'd take the cylinders out. Maybe we needed some more rear tips, we would do it. Or if we thought we oversized, which is pretty rare, we could adjust it. Cylinder tips are good. Everything looks nice and straight. If it didn't look straight and we needed to do something, then we would. And then we're going to close the corporotomies with the stay stitches. We'll convert those into a mattress stitch just by tying them together. And that's what we use for our corporotomy closures. And we, we do a lot of irrigation during the case with the uh, irrigating solution. I think, Mo, I think Chris tells me that you like to really spray the field with the irrigating solution. So the point is, yeah, antibiotic, yeah. So the point is flush away the bacteria. Again, that's standard for any approach that one might take, whether it be scrotal or infrapubic or whatever. The blue towel there is, 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 is soaked in our antibiotic irrigating solution, and we lay that down uh, because we want to, again, we want to minimize any kind of contact of the, of the device with the skin because that's where most of our bacteria come. And you can see this drape that we're using is actually a C-section drape. It's got a little well on the side, and it has that uh, IO band on it. We'll take our finger, and we run that down. This is the only time we're manipulating the scrotum during the case. So we'll use the good old... NS100, the nasal speculum, like my favorite instrument ever, and we'll stuff the pump down in there. So this is the only scrotal manipulation. We'll tuck the pump down in, and then what we're going to do is we're going to give a little pull to get it through the dartos and seat it in position. And then we're ready to go ahead and we're going to make our connections. And so you have the single connection to make, and it's right there. And then what you do is you tuck the tubing down, you bury the tubing, put a couple layers of running closure over the tubing, then the skin, then we use Dermabond, and I'll go on from here. So the infrapubic incision, again, it's, it, there's less dissection just because of the anatomy involved, less pain and swelling, and patients can potentially get to use their devices sooner. Another incision that we have is a subcoronal incision which is my go-to, I don't use it as much, nearly as much, but it's my go-to incision if I need access to the shaft. So if I've got a guy with ED and Peyronie's disease who's going to need plication or grafting or something, with a subcoronal incision, you've got great access to the shaft. Believe it or not, when you take, make the incision and then deglove aggressively, your corporotomies will be in the exact same position as if you had gone through the scrotum. The corporotomies are not more distal. Use this, it works well with the Scott retractor system. And so I don't have a lot of pictures of the subcoronal. I need, to, I need to improve my picture library. But this is a patient who we put his implant in through a subcoronal incision. And so if you can imagine that when you're doing this, you deglove down and you place your ring retractor and then the hooks hold the skin down and your corporotomies are in the same position they would be with a scrotal incision. The reason I did a subcoronal on this guy, and you can see right here, he had really hard, severe plaque and curvature so the subcoronal incision gave us the ability to elevate neurovascular bundle. In this case, we actually excised a lot of this very, very hard spiculated plaque, and we haven't laid our graft in yet, but we will. But that's the advantage of the subcoronal incision. You've got great access to the shaft for what you need to do. So there's different ways to do things. There's different incisions. There's certain things that are standard between all the different incisions. But if you pay attention, if you increase the efficiency, if you do your safety checks, the right incision for the right patient, I think you'll have good results and the patient will be happy. And again, I'm very appreciative to be here today. Thank you very much.